recording. Three, two. Welcome, welcome everybody to today's podcast. Today I have the pleasure of having Gary Newman. Gary Newman is a is one of the best psych, psych, psychotherapists in the world, according to Oprah. New York Times bestseller, author Gary Newman, a psychotherapist, rabbi, and author of several books on the topics of marriage and divorce. There are many over, one of, one of his books had over a million copies of his books. He has been appeared over 50 times on the Today Show, a dozen times on Oprah Winfrey, NBC Dateline, Katie Couric, Steve Harvey, Good Morning America. Oprah referred to Gary as one of the best psychotherapists in the world when she heard of him. And Gary is, is a tremendous. I know he's also helped the Jewish community, and we have many, many, many friends in common, and many people that I know yes. have used you, and you've saved a lot of marriages. So, Thank Gary, you. it's a pleasure, pleasure to have you. I myself have gotten tremendous benefit from your from your talks, and from you, especially the the Sane the talk in South Africa, and and I'm just happy to have you here. We have a we have a lot of people that are single, married. And really, really, we want to get give them the best advice. So again, please thank thank you for for having you here. Thanks, thanks for having me. And listen, I appreciate all you do for people. It's wonderful to inspire people, and you do a great job. And people are talking about you and loving what you're doing, and you're doing it out of your the goodness of your heart. And that's that's the best way and only way to do it. Thank you so much, Gary. <laughs> so, Gary, we're going to start trying to we're going to talk a little. Tell, tell me a little bit about you. How'd you get into this? How'd you get into marriage therapy? Well, I, I always wanted to be a uh, shul rabbi, and I uh, did that for a little bit, got my psychology degree. When that didn't work out, because, as they say, not a good job for a nice Jewish boy, right. <laughs> I, uh, I left that and went into, uh, to be a psychologist. Now, it's interesting how I got into marriage therapy, because it's really been uh, a big love over the last 35 years that I've been doing it. It really started, the first thing I started doing was helping children to divorce. There was this population of, of children divorced all over the world, and um, I really felt for them. And I created a program to have uh, courts mandate if people are going through divorce. They had these programs for parents that I had written, but I wanted to mandate something for children. So I'm happy to say that over the years, over 300,000 children around the world have gone through my programs where they sit with other children, 8 to 10 children at a time, and they see the similarities, the differences. They get support from each other. And, and when I saw how many children divorce, I studied their, their drawings. I wrote my first book, Helping Your Kids Cope with Divorce, The Sandcastles Way. The Sandcastles Program is a name. Boy, I just, you know, you feel for these children. And, and they go through so much. And they are so misunderstood and so right. neglected. So once I did that, I said to myself, you know, if I really, really want to help children divorce, I could really work on trying to help their parents stay married <laughs> because that's the <laughs> right, real right, thing to do. Right. And the next many books I wrote was all about studying marriage. And I studied failed marriages versus, versus successful marriages and did a lot of research, two major research projects internationally that are the subjects of two of my books. And really started to find some real, you know, at the heart, what's going on with so many marriages and have been applying that, trying to uncomplicate the way everybody makes right. marriage so complicated. And I don't know what, it, 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 trying to really get to the heart of it and make a difference. I mean, you, the statistics are definitely against this. First time marriage is 50 percent. Second time marriage is 75 percent. I yeah. mean, you're almost you're Correct. almost a chance Correct. not to yeah. make it. Right, exactly. So Second time is like approach. sixty, third time is like right. seventy two. So just when you thought it was safe to date. Wow. And I always tell people, if you're not going to really work on yourself, then what are you doing in your second marriage? Because people always say, Be warned, anybody who gets divorced. Most people, if you tell, ask somebody, why did you get divorced, they have two answers. One answer is my ex was crazy, right. which takes no responsibility of me. The second one, I was young and stupid. Again, another answer that says, I don't really have to search into myself. And then you marry the second person, and very often, wherever you had in the first, you tend to find the same kind of person. They look different, they sound different, but personality, the way they make you feel, the way they react to you, you start to feel the same way, and, you, and people realize that they're in the same spot. It's, also wow. having kids. Having it's kids amazing how you, well. how, because so many people have lost their self-esteem because of bad, bad, you know, bad divorces, yeah. and uh, you know, it's never too late to have a ha happy childhood. I guess, if you're yeah. able to not make it about you. Correct. Um, yeah, divorce is tragic for people. It, it right. really hits us to the core. I mean, we get married primarily, everybody remember this, right. to be built up. I got married because I want my spouse to build me up. I didn't get married for my spouse to criticize me and tell me what I need to do differently, and that's not it. 
So that's what marriage is about, and we'll talk more about that. But unfortunately, sure. in divorce, people have gotten quite the opposite, and they've been torn apart by the person who they thought was their person who was going to love them no matter what and accept them. And that's a huge hit to one's ego, and it's hard to right. regroup, especially when you have little trauma. children having difficulty, and you got to take care of them also. So it's, it's a tough spot, and, and uh, we really need to help that population as well. And there's no – I mean, uh, I went through myself, and there's no training for this. I mean, nobody right. trains you, and nobody – especially in – even if you go to a Jewish school, I mean, you're not getting trained for this. No, no, you're not getting, you're not trained, getting trained for trained divorce. For but no. You're also not getting trained for marriage, mind right. you. Correct. I'll have you exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, with all the yeshiva and seminary and modern Orthodox world, we, you know, we have these nice little poet, right. poetic things about Avram and Sarah. But, you know, there's really no training okay. how to get along, the sacrifices you make, what you, are your realistic expectations, what are your needs right. versus wants. All those things. And, you're, and definitely we're underestimating how much work we have to put in. Yes. I think that's one of the things that I, I, that I learned. And wow, this is a lot of work. Yeah. People will say to work. me, if I, 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 is it too much work? Maybe this marriage isn't right because I have to work so hard at it. Uh, no. Correct. <laughs> no. That's not the definition of it being too much. I mean, hard work is normal. You know, you get into situations where it's abusive and, you know, nothing is helping or the person refuses help. There are certain things sure. where you say we really have to start thinking about something different. But, of course, it's work every day, but it's, it's loving work, and they're supposed to be filled with a lot of good moments, which you're supposed to appreciate and you're supposed to remember. We're very quick in life to take for granted what's right. good and hone in on what needs to change, and that is a disaster for a marriage. The spotlight effect. Like we always, we always see what's wrong, not what's right. Right. Tell me, tell me, with the your thirty five years, what are you seeing in two thousand twenty three, as the common, common couple comes up to you? What What are the issues in two thousand twenty three? Well, how has it changed between ten years ago and today? So you'd be surprised, and I think this is true about marriage all over the world, because I have had people fly in from, you know, Jordan and India, and Australia, wow. marriages are very similar because people really do want the same things in marriages. I mean, they change. I mean, today there's no doubt, you know, we always talk about the generation. We expect more. We expect to give less, perhaps. Um, I mean, listen, surely I once did a study of people who are married uh, 50 years or more, and I did that study 20 years ago. So that was different, you know? Right. If you were married in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, I remember one person saying, oh, yeah, we spent a lot of time at night. We didn't have a telephone, you know? <laughs> we came home, and we spent every night together. And I was comparing that to what we do today, right. where spending time together is quite impossible. So if I had to say there's things are largely the same, except the bigger difference is that with technology, our ability to spend time, focused, uninterrupted time on our spouse, with our spouse, is, is out the window. That has been right. greatly complicated and reduced, and it is so vibrant to a relationship. And I'll tell you this right now, Gedalia, because if you say to me, what's, what's one of the things that you've learned over the years that are important to the heart of a marriage? And I'll tell you, it's time. People want to sit here, and they want to tell you and everybody else, it's communication, say, you know, you say instead of darn you and I, whatever. And, of course, those are all very, very important. And I teach communication skills, of course. But it's a non-starter if you don't have time together yeah. uninterrupted. So when I did my study, we saw that the people, it was fascinating, it started to plot along the research. The people who said that they were happily married, I asked the question, uh, what on an average daily, daily average basis, how often do you spend time every day? uninterrupted talking. And they were at the 30-minute or above mark, okay? Hmm. The unhappy couples were below 30 minutes. It became very clear. 25% of a day, daily average. Doesn't mean you have to do it every day, right. you know, but, but it means if you spend an hour this day and not next day, whatever. But it was clear that people were happily married were spending 30 minutes a day or more. 25% of the happily married couples said they were spending more than 60 minutes a day uninterrupted talking. 25% of unhappy couples said they were spending less than five minutes a day. 
Wow. So you started to see that you could talk about how wonderful you are and how much you love each other, but if you are split so many ways that you just don't have the time to sit and talk and catch up on your day, then you're, you're right. going you're roommate. nowhere. You're you're roommates. Your roommates, and, and worse than that also, is you're sharing your day with somebody, but it's not your spouse. You're sharing with your coworker, maybe an opposite gender coworker, but right. you're sharing with the guys, with the women, with the whoever, and you're not hunkering down with your spouse and just having that loving time to connect. And it's, it's, a, it's a disaster for marriage wow. because you have to have that. And it's easy to lose it. We want to work and make money. We have all these children. And those two items, let's remember, can take, they take up all of your time. Sure. Your children want your t energy 24-7. And no matter how wonderful a parent and how much energy you give them, they'll want more. Your work nowadays, especially, there's no end to work. Correct. Two in the morning, you're, you're, you're texting, you're, you're doing all kinds of things. But when I say to people, what about your marriage? Do you have some separate, in that pie chart of life, do you have a sliver in there that is just your marriage? Most people would say, I don't, which is why most marriages are either divorced right. or unhappy. Lack of presence. Absolutely. But they, if, if they don't have even time for their, their spouse, they don't have even time to work on themselves. So even you could see how this is just a disaster. Yeah, they don't have more happen. time to work on themselves at all. Right. Now, people, will, they, might, they, they might go to therapy and work on themselves more than they work on their marriage. Right. It's just that people expect love is, should just be right. going on its right. own. I fall in love. I don't think about it. I don't have to do anything to make that engine work. And you're just not putting any gas in the engine. It just it doesn't work in any other part of your world. If I said to you, you're, I'm going to give you a great business, congratulations, $20 million, Correct. here's the building. Uh, you're going to spend uh, you know, 16 minutes every three days on it, focused. Bingo. What's going to happen? It doesn't work anywhere else. But for some reason, for marriage, we just think it should just coast along and we should just be so happy and understanding of each other and so in love. And it just it doesn't work. I, I work a lot with singles and I, work, I do a lot of these singles events. And, you know, one of, one of the lines that Rabbi Rush said to me, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, you can marry the best person and have the worst marriage and you can marry the worst person and have the best marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to what you're saying. It's not it's not the person. This is why. You know, when I got remarried, I got remarried really quick because I knew it was going to be a process. I it, sure. I it was going to work. <clears throat> right. Where today you see so much of indecision, waiting for the right one to show up, right one for the they don't right. understand the work has to be done. Correct. At, no matter who you marry, and ninety percent of the people who I who you end up marrying end up changing. Have you seen that? For sure. The, all the work happens right. after you hit the glass at the chuppah. That's when it all starts. Right. What you do then is going to make the difference, and everybody needs to know that. Once you get married, people will change. Correct. It doesn't stay by the rules that you decided at the beginning because we, we're living beings that change. We, we discover new things about Correct. ourselves. Some of those things wonderful, some of those things terrible. We remember, pe people remember things from childhood that they didn't even know got them down. They have relationships with siblings, with parents that affect them. A parent passes away. You know, we talk sure. about the midlife crisis. You know, something Trauma. happens in life sure. that causes us to be pushed off our mark. You know, the human being, I like to think of it as a juggler. We are keeping lots of balls in the air. And sometimes when something happens that just pulls one hand down, we just don't lose one ball. <laughs> they lose all everything. come coming down. Right. And that's the time when spouses have to pull together right. as a team. And if there's a, another thing I always try to explain is that you two are a team. A teammate, if you're playing a, a game, you're, you're in the NBA, and one of your teammates is not pulling their weight, if you sit there and scream at them and say, pull your weight, darn it, do your thing, and I'm not helping you, then you're losing. Right. It just doesn't work. You go to your teammate and you say, listen, you need to help here. How do I help you? How do I fill in during this time while you're getting stronger or getting yourself back on your feet? That's what a team does, and that's how they win. So uh, my father-in-law, may rest in peace, was a, a giant of a man, a judge for 37 years, and he, he would always tell people and, and remind me, he said, remember to, as a, as a team, attack the problems. Don't attack each other. Nice. And it really sticks with me. Don't go, d don't go down with the ship, bottom line. Is yeah. And h how do you see this as you see this constantly in, obviously, people changing, 
you know, in, in with Jews, with religious levels constantly going up and down. How do you deal with that common conflict? One person gets more religious, the other one gets less. One is a grounds for divorce, one is a not grounds for divorce. Right. This is a very common right. situation. Well, a lot of judgment happens when one sure. gets stronger and the other one, instead of understanding. Um, and it's funny how we have 33 days just to work on our character traits. These are the days of the Omer. Mm -hmm. how, how the Torah is like telling you, this is what you got to work on. Yes. Yes. Explain to you, what do you do? What do you do with couples that are yeah. one's religious, I think one's it, not? It, I think it goes, it goes both ways. So being that I'm Shomer Shabbos, so people will come to me, and the person who's getting more religious will always think they got me. You know, I'm nice. on their side. Wow. <laughs> because they're going to tell me, well, of course, you're not going to tell me not to become more religious. So here's the deal. Yeah. For some reason, God put you two together. Right. Becoming more religious and more spiritual, wonderful. I'm a fan I, 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 I'm a proponent. But that doesn't mean that you get to, in a marriage, drive off by yourself, become whatever you want to become, and suddenly turn back and say, hey, now, you, pss, over here. That's right. not the way it works. So you might want to become more religious. But now you have to think to yourself, how do I do this in a way that includes my spouse? So that might mean Rabbi so-and-so who speaks to me right. might not speak to my spouse. So now I have to go find a rabbi who speaks maybe a little less to me, but still to me, but also speaks to my spouse. Maybe I have to go slower in some directions or faster but not expect those changes from my spouse. So what happens with religion, the mistake that people who are becoming more religious is that they feel that they are right. And that's, that's always dangerous in a marriage. I'm right. right, you're wrong. You have to do what is right. As opposed to, I'm learning something new that I feel is correct, it is meaningful. How do I share this with you? Most spouses who are healthy and in love will go anywhere with each other. That's right. the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to practically not recognize ourselves 35 years later. Especially, imagine, you have children. You know, if your child suddenly, I had a child who became a jujitsu expert, whatever. I Believe you me, when I got married, I never thought I'd know anything about jujitsu. Look at me. I'm not doing jujitsu, mm -hmm. but I knew all about it. I, because you learn about those you love when you're brought into it. So I think everybody has to think about religion as something that's another meaningful, important part of my life. So the person who's not as religious should not start saying, oh, you're going to make me, or now you're going to want me to eat kosher and put something on my head or, or do this or do that. Instead saying, okay, if I'm with my spouse and it's bringing more light to our lives right. and more fun and more interest, then let's, let's do that. But honey, please, let's do it in a way that does speak to both of us. And we have to remember that Compromise. God made genders very differently. So what is meaningful to a man is going to be different and not as meaningful to a woman and vice versa. So very often, again, you have the religious person running off, becoming very involved, what he or she specifically sees in me as meaningful. And it doesn't necessarily speak to the spouse because the spouse is going to attach to God in a, in a whole different way. Right. I, I remember I once had a, um, when, I was, when I was rabbi, a rabbi of a shul, I, I once had someone come speak. And, and his thing was uh, from, he had a, a picture of him as, a little, as an 18-year-old hustling pool. And now he was a chassid with this big, you know, big mm. beard. And he said, and I asked him, I said, what made you from? What did it for you? How did you go from pool hustler to chassid, you know? And he told me, the Kitzer Shulchanar. He said, someone handed me this, this law book, and it told you what to do when you get up in the morning, what to do in the day, what to do at night. It had these laws that gave me a clear direction. And I thought to myself, how funny, like, at the time, that's not at all what spoke to me in my Judaism. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, I was loving Shabbos and right, singing right. and being around people, right? And, right? And I realized so clearly that, wow, people can be religious for completely different reasons. And, and, and that's what's wonderful mm -hmm. about it, how, how Hashem made us to be able, that's what he put a piece of him in us, that we could actually get to decide where to go with all of this and attract and have relationship to Hashem in very different ways. So I say that to couples. It doesn't have to be your way, but you right. can't run off and leave the other one behind. Let's do it together. Right. Because, I mean, that, that's definitely an, an issue that's happening a lot. 
And again, it's not really one job to the other one's one's job to fix the other one. And we, we think, hey, my job is to fix this person and mm -hmm. to fix that person. And the more you push it, the more demands people walk away. Like Rob Dressler says, when the demands begin, love departs. Right. Right. And that's the issue with religion. Like that's I'm saying, with Frumkite, you know, there's a right and a wrong. So that's right. where people think that they're justified and it's obvious for them. You know, the other thing is we all have to learn as we age, and it's very hard, that our spouse doesn't, isn't us. So, and our children aren't us. We feel so responsible, like, oh, people are going to see my spouse, and they're going to think that's me, and I can't have my spouse be doing that. I can't have my children be doing that. As opposed to realizing that Hashem did make us all very unique. And as much as so many people, I, I feel they have it all figured out. Right. <laughs> I don't, mm -hmm. and I don't know how they do, but Hashem put people together, put kids with right. their parents. Hashem had a plan, but the plan was not necessarily to be a carbon copy of you. Your spouse doesn't have to do exactly what you do when you do it. So if you're becoming more religious and your spouse isn't yet there, it, it has to it, be it's sometimes really the okay. language or the, or the I mean, because at the end of the day the benefits are amazing. I mean, you have a day of Shabbat is a day of presence. Everybody's present. There's nowhere to run. Nida definitely uh, in you know it sparks the marriage brand new. I mean, every law is definitely much better for for the marriage long run. I for mean, sure. Listen, yeah. God made me. Even the statistics and he made are us. made. Yeah. yeah. And every day, exactly. Every time we have an updated research about yeah. psychologically, it always fits. It always fits. Correct. You know, Shabbos now, they, people are talking about it in the secular world, but it's not called, you know, right. whatever it's called, you know, uh, disconnecting, whatever. Like, right. spend, they're just trying to get four hours. Digital Sabbath hours. or something. Exactly. Something like that. Everybody's, everybody's trying to do it. You know, uh, Nida, try to, you know, right. not have intimacy for that period of time, and that really drives up, right. of course. So it always it always fits in. And I'm not in any way the odds suggesting... Go up. The odds go up. I mean, Andrew Huberman had a whole study on how some sectors... You know, Andrew Huberman is he's a, yeah. he is a, he's a science, uh, scientist, and he came up with all these... And he says p couples that were able to separate and come back, they have much, much longer relationships. So even the research, is the science is there that you're going to have a better marriage, you're going to have a happier marriage, and it's going to be last longer. For sure, right. for sure. That's why it is re religion is speaks to to me and and everyone who is religious. You know, when you're on the outside, right. everybody always hears the prohibitions. People, how many people have told you you can't do that for twenty five hours? That must be the worst yeah. day of the year. But we all, to us, we're like, oh God, what are you, God, what are you talking is about? coming. Oh, my God, I wish I was here a day early. And we're all saying no because you're missing all the other part, the, the beauty and the and the presence of, right. of life and and family and and connection. It's remarkable. So I think all of that is is important for marriage. It's just a matter of people um, bringing another another soulful thing that's meaningful to them rather than using it as something that sure. separates us. And that's what's so amazing. Follow God's laws, okay? Your interpretation, your additions, your your voice, whether it's if if it's loving or it's angry, you know that's not God anymore. You know right. that's your choice. Uh, you know Hashem played this out for us. He gave us a roadmap, and and I live my life trying to just follow those laws as best I can. Right. Especially if you had a bad experience with a rabbi or situation, you're yeah. you're throwing down the whole the whole religion, which is which is a, such a problem. A lot of people I see that they have a bad experience in a, that is true. In a, a school, of, yes. in an area, a yes. synagogue, then they say, oh, it's just it's like a bad case of food poisoning. You know. You're, you're so right, and yeah. um, especially even if you trail it back to childhood, it's terrible. Sure. I know people who were felt uh, mistreated uh, in schools. I, I don't mean you know immoral mm -hmm. or illegal acts. I mean you like, know that's a one or thing. a cold experience, just, just yelled yeah. at by by rebbies sure. or whatever, and cold and experience. they really just they're not religious today. They just went away from it. And I and right. I think if anything you're saying to anybody out there, and I, I think nowadays it's much better than when I was a kid as far as you know mechanachim teachers getting real education, but that all of us, all of us represent what's going to happen to people in their lives. So if somebody meets you on the street, I don't care if you're a teacher, if you're a rabbi, or you're just a neighbor, remember, you're making an impression on people. And right. their impression of Judaism and religiousness is going to depend on, on how they feel about you. And the, and the one reason people want to become deal. religious is because they see somebody religious, they see, boy, that person seems loving, happy, nice. they're working well in life with their family and spouse, and that's the inspiration. Ruth, 
Rus did not fall in love with God. She fell in love with her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law was a spiritual, wonderful woman. We connect to God right. through people that we connect with, and we need to be the representation. And that's work on ourselves, and it only helps us like it helps others. If a mother-in-law can get a daughter-in-law to be true, <laughs> that, that itself is a miracle. Itself. I always tell my daughter-in-law, that's the message <laughs> wow. from Ruth. You must love your mother-in-law. <laughs> Let, let's talk about it as a subject that you've spoken a lot about in Oprah. Why yes. do men cheat? Let's talk about it, wh infidelity in a relationship. Sure. And when is it grounds for divorce? When is it not? How, how do you work with such something like that? Sure. Okay, a lot of things there. Let's let's yeah. unpack it little by little, and you keep reminding me of the questions as we go along. Um, first of all, let's keep in mind that a lot of people physically cheat. Okay. It's it's very unfortunate. The statistic around men is all over the map, but I think it's kind of accepted that fifty percent of men oh, wow. cheat. Uh, some are 50%? less, some are more. Yes. Wow, that's a big physically. number. We're talking about physically. Sure. Women, in my study of over uh, wow. 400, 39% of them cheated. This is in the secular world. I'm just, it wasn't. Sure, in, sure. In it's just, you're taking I mean, I, I, I hope it's less in the religious world, obviously. Wow. Um, it's a big so number. So it's, it's a huge number. Wow. A lot more women cheat than, than we realize because men are less looking and aware. Women are, are more than men thinking about it you know men it's like it's off our right. map like my wife cheating nah come on you know right. <laughs> so there's a lot more women i think starts with the romance there. bottles <laughs> like the men for men it's a different kind of uh men watch the watch the when the woman is more into the romance bottles, yeah it looks like. that's true however what was remarkable to me when i studied 200 men 100 who had physically cheated 100 remained faithful so everyone said to me you know why men cheat oh i'll give you the one two and three sex sex and sex Incorrect. Wow. Only about 8% of men said that the primary reason was because of sexual dissatisfaction with their spouse. 8% said that about was 8%. the reason. The large percent, almost 48%, said it was about emotional dissatisfaction. So this is what I learned about men very That's clearly huge. that we all have to learn, is that men are very emotional beings. We don't, we fool women. Because we walk around strutting our stuff, and you know, don't Correct. don't don't pat me on the head, and don't you know, give me a little you know kiss on my kepi. You know, I'm a man. You know what I'm saying? But the fact is, we're very emotional beings, and one of the things we crave the most is a sense of knowing that what we're doing is right, is right and we're appreciated for it. So here's the example that I give that I think men really relate to, and women relate to. You have a guy watching his sports team. Okay, which Miami is my Heat. which is my favorite example <laughs> that you use, by the way. Miami Heat, I love they're doing example. amazing things. Yes. Last night I was on Shabbos, so last right. night I literally watched every minute. Last night till one in the morning, every minute of that game. You know right. what I'm saying? I'm I'm. A, if I say to women, if you see your man watching a sports event and the way he's going on and hooping and screaming, yelling, you would definitely think he's got some percentage ownership in this team. I mean, you know, the guy's like going nuts, right? right. And, and you can't believe that. Like, he, he, he doesn't have any ownership in this team at all. He's just rooting for his team. Amazing. However, when it gets toward the end of the game and it becomes clear to him that his team cannot win, almost all men turn off the TV. Right. They turn it off. Because when heat a games. man, <laughs> what we've left heat games in the third quarter, <laughs> exactly in the past, exactly, and recently against Milwaukee, it was like the last second that right. Jimmy Butler it was unbelievable. So yeah. if you turned it off, so a lot of people stay to the very end, right? But but let's say you're at the end of the NBA game. There's three seconds left, and you're 12 points down. I mean, you're turning off the TV. Turning it's done. Me. It's impossible. That's the way men are. Men love. They love to win. And when they get to the point where they feel they cannot win, they turn off. Hmm. That's the way we work. Such a, such, a, such a true analogy. So women need to learn f for their benefit is I just got to make my man feel like he's winning. That means that when he does things, I appreciate it. And this is a big vice versa also, obviously. Sure. But my point is that he has to feel like he wins. Now, a lot of women will think, you know, I don't tell him. They've told me. 
I don't want to tell him too much how great right. a job he's doing because then he's going to think, okay, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. I'm a right. cool dude. Opposite. Opposite. You Opposite. tell a guy he's winning, he will ring that bell. He loves it. We Opposite. will keep running and doing and doing if we feel we're winning. So one of the major things that men, if I found out, the difference between men who are cheating and not cheating was the sense of appreciation. Men who feel appreciated by their spouses, they really love to be around their spouses. They love to give more. They love to do more. They, they have energy for that. And men who feel like no matter what they do, they just, they just can't win. They just can't win. Check out. Those are the ones who check out. Now, wow. again, I got to make this caveat because I was on Oprah. I mean, I, I, get, I, I don't want thousands no, we, of emails that say I'm, justif I'm not justifying cheating. It's no, ugly. No, no, it's correct. disgusting. You have other options. You could divorce. It could I be divorce. Tell doesn't mean, divorce. Yeah, don't, doesn't cheat. don't cheat. Do not cheat. I always no matter tell people what. the same thing. You know? Divorce, don't cheat. Get help, whatever. whatever. you can, don't but cheat. But the point is, if you want to know, and we're not just talking about cheating, you want to know what's, what's making an unsuccessful marriage, the lack of appreciation is the main thing. So when people come to me and say, what's the one thing that you would tell any couple that would change your marriage immediately? And they always say, communication, right? I say, uh, no, it's appreciation. Yeah. Because it, it, when men, and now let's talk about women. Women, what we've done to women in our society, we've, we've really given them a bad deal, okay? We told them years ago, don't work, stay home, stay pretty, have children. Well, that was dismissive. And that, was, that turned out to be ugly. So we said, oh, now go work and we will, you know, we'll split the thing. We'll split all the work at home and we'll split all the time and all the chores. You know, bubkis. So, mm -hmm. so women now, they have to work. They have to take care of the kids. So they have to do wins. everything. They have to do everything. And like guys are looking at them and saying, uh, yeah, well, you know, so yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. You know what well. I mean? And that's the number one killer of appreciation. I will take people, couples of my house, and I'll say, look, I, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and here's, I want you to write down an appreciation list. What do you appreciate about your spouse? They don't need 10 minutes. Two minutes. They can barely crank out two or three things, and obvious things are always missing from the list. Well, what about the fact that she's a great mom? What about the fact that, you know, she's, she works? What about the fact, and, or, or the same, great dad, great, and they always say, oh, well, she's supposed to do that. He's supposed to do that. Like, you don't get appreciation for what you're supposed to do. Well, 90% of our effort every day is what we're supposed to do. But you, you don't think I'm supposed to be appreciative for it? You're only supposed to give me appreciation when I do something way yeah, above the call of duty. you wow. got to be kidding me. Wow. I want to feel appreciated for the things I work so hard at on a regular basis. So she has resentment, and then basically she's, you're, they're playing resentment back and forth. Sure, everybody's feeling like, you know, you're, you're unappreciating, you're unappreciating, unappreciating, you're unappreciating. So what happens? I do less and less and and I don't care more and more about what you want because you know what's the difference and that's when people feel they're so in this true. rut they're in this rut and we're going nowhere and it's just getting up every day and doing the same thing and then what we do is we try to right. find moments of happiness you know with our children or with friends or at a simcha or whatever and we and we lose the feeling of just being able to be in the arms you know, metaphorically and physically of our spouse and just, you know, being with each other and loving each other. We, we get married because we want somebody to accept sure. us. We want somebody to look at all of ourselves, all of us, if we look in the mirror and we only see our negatives, we all look ugly. We want somebody who could look at all of us, see all those negatives, but see all those positives and sum us up for good. And that's what appreciation is. Appreciation is you're a lot, okay? But everything and everything, when I say thank you, you're wonderful this way, that way, I have summed you up for the good. And if everybody can leave this podcast and they can say, okay, every day, I'm going to make two appreciative gestures daily. It can be a verbal comment. Right. I thank you so much for Words of helping doing this, having you for affirmations. It can be a, a, a physical appreciation. I got you this flower. I got you this magazine. Right. You know, thank you for staying up with me last night when I wasn't feeling well, getting me tea, whatever it seems is. Seems so simple. You know? It's just, it, doesn't it? It, it seems so simple. It's just, how, how, and when, we, and when people, how is everything so complicated? Well, I, we, we're just, we're, we're, I think there's something for some reason in society that we are not ingrained in us that marriage is in and of itself a being that has to be nurtured. Right. And let's, let's face facts. 
because marriage statistics are so poor, right? 50% of first marriages end in divorce. But what you don't realize is that the other 50% that remain married, okay, only about uh, 25 to 29% of them are happily married, <laughs> okay? So on your first wow. chance, you got about a, a 70% chance of being unhappily married or divorced, you know? So what does this mean? It means that most people, most people were raised by parents. They didn't have a good marriage either, Correct. right? And their parents didn't have a good marriage. So right. I think it's this thing yeah. where, like, it's ingrained in us. Like, hurt people hurt others. Right? Exactly. Right. Hurt people hurt people. And, and, and we're just not learning. It's not ingrained in us, this concept. So, and even when you, you know, when you go to classes, I mean, I think there are now more than ever, you know, classes in Shurim about, you know, trying to be kind, right. you know, and trying to work on your marriage. But it's just you have to say to yourself, what have I done for my marriage lately? What have I done for my marriage lately? That's the way we raise our kids, you know? I don't go to my, th th so my kid in, in third grade and say, you know, I love you. I, I got to work really hard on this project. In, in about three months, let's go on vacation and let's, you know, catch up, right? It's ridiculous. But we do it to our marriages all the time. Yeah. We don't talk. We ignore. But no we're going on vacation in six right. months. We're going on vacation, honey, for seven days, right. you know, whatever. Done. Let's talk about the date night because you brought it up. So that's I one thing I. What, that's one thing I've always. I've always. Um, the date night thing is. I think it's crucial. Date night once a try. Try to w two days away vacation also once a month. Yeah, that's good. That's great. Yeah. Let's talk about date night. Yeah. So I love date night. My wife and I did it for me for years and years. Still do. It's just easier when you don't have kids. So it's it's much easier. But what we did when we had five kids. Thank God we had we have five kids when they were little. Um, we had the, the when they had the five. It was hard to get out. We made a date night. And we, what we did was we made the same night every week. Ours was Thursday night. Could be Saturday night, right. whatever it is. And I hired the babysitter in advance. I said, every Thursday night, I'm paying you pre -commit. this. Pre-commit. You pre-commit it. Because I'm Jewish. So no matter how tired I was, if I had to pay that babysitter, I was going out. <laughs> <laughs> okay? That's it. So now here's the rule. When you go out on a date night, minimum of two hours alone without another couple. Right. Okay, because when you go out with another couple, you know how it is. The, the men talking to men, women talking to men, sure. alone. Three things you cannot talk about on your date night. Money, work, and kids. That's it. And everybody always laughs at me and says, well, well, that's all we ever talk about. And that's the point. When you are falling in love, I promise you, you, weren't talking you about were not talking about money, so work, and the stress of kids. Because if you were, you never would have gotten right. married. <laughs> Trust me. We forget that our spouse is the one we're supposed to be talking about, what we saw on TV, what we read, a right. little gossip, a little this, whatever it is. We're supposed to be li talking about if it's politics, if it's religion, whatever. And when you, So that's what the date night is about. And I warn people not to always go out on a date night to dinner. Dinner, for some people, works fine. But you know, for Different most things. people, you sit down at a dinner, you're there for two, three hours, you, you gotta have a lot of material. You know, I mean, you better come with some material. My wife and I, because when we go out to dinner, um, you know, if we go out often, we'll 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 have Google things like you know, uh, ten best questions on a date. Like we're married thirty five years, okay? Wow. <laughs> we're saying wow. We do that. Or um, who you know, best picture Oscars the last twenty years. Like how many can right. you name? Just fun stuff. You need material. You yeah, need to too. talk about something. You, otherwise, you're going to be talking about the stress. Right. So. The date night is a time just to have fun and try to remember this is why we got together and we fell in love. So for everybody who's out there who's thinking my marriage isn't going well, instead of thinking I have to get to somebody and talk about the rotten stuff that's going right. on and how we fix it, the other thing you can do is you can start appreciating each other a couple times a day. You could start spending at least 30 minutes, you know, uninterrupted, have a glass of wine or, or a Coke or whatever you're doing and sitting around and, and, and schmoozing. You can start going out on a date night. And after a couple of weeks, you're saying, wow, like we've really turned it around. We still have our stuff that we have to deal with. But assuming we're not talking about, you know, tragic mm -hmm. or difficult things, uh, that are really stopping the marriage from even liking each other. If we have, hopefully, if you haven't gotten to that point, you haven't gotten right. there. Um, these other techniques really are the movement for what the marriage, instead of focusing on what's not going right, change what needs to be going in a positive direction. And another thing I, th I think that I've seen, um, you know, for the experience that I've seen, is a lot of times people get married, and then, then one of them just lets themselves go. Hey, I'm married. I got it in the bag. Mm -hmm. And that's also a ma major problem. I mean, yeah. what do you, what do you, you got married to somebody, all of a sudden they let themselves go. 
They don't take care of themselves anymore, and that's yeah. also it. Feels like hey, I got I got duped over here. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, you know, health health ways you got to take care of yourself. You know, it's also put yourself together. A lot of you don't have it in the bag. Correct, correct. Again, it, I, I like to think to myself, what have I done for my wife lately? I do. Um, you know what 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 is my add value? to her life. What's my value add? I think that's the way you say it. Sure. Right? What's my value add right. to my added life? Added value. How, how, did, how do we how, what add am I value doing here, to this right? relationship? Am I just, and, and, and I think we all have to be kind of honest with ourselves. What am I really adding to my wife, uh, my spouse today? And if you're going to say, well, you know, money, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, but they could get, uh, you know, I take care of his kids or I, I don't know. That's, what, that's not the answer. Right. The answer's got to be, how am I, what am I doing? It's got to be the love, the interest, the, the support. Uh, you know, what does that translate to? Because everybody says, I love you, and everybody says love and whatever. But love really is an action, and it's got to be consistent. That's very important. Consistent. A lot of people get confused with that because they, they say, my spouse loves me, he or she says they love me, whatever. But they love them on a Monday, but Tuesday through Thursday is hell. You know, and then we got to, you know, that's not, that's not love that's sustainable. Right. I often say to people, I understand you. I really, really understand you. But that doesn't make, mean that your marriage is sustainable. You can have your feelings and you can be entitled to them and they can be understandable. But, but you can't live in a marriage holding on to them and, and putting them right. forefront. So we have to say that on a daily basis, what am I doing to show and care my, for my spouse? And to your other point, it's simple, and it's, you don't have to lose your day job. The fact is you don't have to put as much time into your spouse as you do for a business or your children. You can survive on a half an hour a day and two hours a, a week right. and little emojis, you know, a minute here, a minute there. You can because we, we are drawn to each other. God put attraction into ourselves. Like, it's mm -hmm. there. I don't have to convince myself. But I must do the bare minimum to really feel like this person gets me. All we want in life, Gedalia, is we want someone to get us. We right. just want that one person. They don't have to know better than us. They don't have to be smarter than us. I just want somebody to feel like you really get my feelings and you understand me. Don't play devil's advocate. Don't tell me what I could have done and should have done. Mm -hmm. Just understand me. And, and, and that's all we need to be for each right. other largely and not get into all the rest. That's exactly the energy of this week, Hod. Hod is really understanding, submission, mm -hmm. like on the, trying, to, trying to be. What do you do with... Um, what do you do with a person that wants to put 90% effort and the other person has 10% effort? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, if, if you're forcing a guy to stay married or you're forcing yeah. somebody to be married, which is really, which is, it could cripple somebody's self esteem that the other side doesn't really want it. I'm yeah. sure you get that a lot. Oh, yeah. No, it, you, I'm, a, I'm you very have a lopsided effort. I, I am, what do you, do you with know, that? unlike, I think, many other therapists. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear. We I mean, know many I, examples. I, I, to, uh, we, we both know friends that have these yeah. kind of examples. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love people. And in my love for people, I, I can't have them sit in their muck and, and pretend and continue to be hurt. So one of the things I do help in these kinds of situations, sure. of course, the first action is to try to get that person to understand, try to pull that person in. It's not always over until it's over. But there are some people that seem unreachable. They're too hurt to really be able to get in the game. And to that, I explain to the spouse who wants this marriage and wants to make it work. I'm very clear with them. I say, listen, you can't make yourself vulnerable to where you're getting hurt. You cannot keep hoping mm. for something that's not going to happen. And then every time you hope, with, because there's you a little something, more. you get knocked down more. And I say to them, you don't have to wonder or guess if the person changes. Because they always say to me, I, I, I think he or she changed. Did this happen? Maybe they changed. I said, no, uh, right. You won't have to guess. If they truly changed, you will know. They will come to you. They will say, oh, my gosh, I, I, I just can't believe the way I've been treating you. I apologize. I'm going to do everything I can. I might make a lot of mistakes. You'll know. You'll know. Until then, nothing's changed. Right. Okay? And therefore, if you want to stay married, and this is, I think this goes into the secular world for sure as well, but surely in, our, in, in the 
you know, religious, orthodox, monotheistic world. It has lots of benefits to staying together for the sake of children. You know, it's, it's different. You know, people will do that. So people have to realize if you want to stay together, and, and what are you staying together for? If that's the reason you're staying together, my children, um, whatever it is, finances, uh, the, the right. society, what I get from this, you know, whatever the case might be, that's fine. Understand, that's the reason. It's not because you're hoping that you're going to get this wonderful, magnanimous, you know, individual to love you back. That's not the reason anymore. And it's very hard to you know, be in a system where you're, you know, kind of acting, kind of just finding your way, but knowing that underneath it, I cannot let my heart go out to this person because it's mm -hmm. been stabbed too much. Wow. And when that person is unwilling to get help or unwilling to change, you know, that's the way it is. Because sometimes you need it. Um, sometimes, God forbid, suppressed emotions. You don't get a divorce. God forbid you can get cancer. I mean, there's so much, so much damage that people are, they're staying in toxic relationships. Like, they don't get out. They can physically get sick. I, I, I tell people that. I tell people that. It might not Sometimes happen until you have like to 50 get out. or in Correct. that time. You know, you get, the body gets older. It can't handle some of these things. So yeah, you can't handle so it. So for sure, so this is the process. Some people just get there too soon, and they think that their spouse is, you know, it's going to shelf and way too early. And say, no, no, let's let's work. Let's give some time. And maybe if he or she is at a, a 10 out of 100, you know, 0 to 100, maybe you'll get them to a 25 or a 30 and 40, and that's good. That's much better instead of hoping for the 100. Some people, they have tried, and they've tried too much. And I have to explain to them that, no, stop, stop. It, it, it's going to stay at a 10, and that's it. And, and you're not getting anywhere close to 100 or anywhere close to 11, you know. <laughs> so, right. therefore, if you want to stay together, you need to close up so that you're not – don't have that vulnerability, even though you might have to go through some actions that smile and look right. like you're in a marriage. And then, to your point of not getting sick, you have to find those pieces – in other places. In your spouse, you expected, you know, a, a percentage, you know, call it 60%. Well, now you're going to have to take that 60%. You're going to have to have 20% there with something that you're doing to help others, 30% right. there with a new business, 10% there with a friend and family. You have to find a way to still live right. and breathe and find it. And that's okay. It's different than what you expected, but it doesn't all have to be from your spouse when you're in so called a bad marriage. Now, the next part is toxicity. There are people who are just getting beaten up emotionally and, and, and yet alone physically, God forbid, of course, but it's all terrible. And sometimes those people, they have to, you know, draw the line and they have to exit. They have to get support from people. It's hard. There are a lot of families that don't want their right. sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, you know, getting divorced. They don't get the support that they need, um, you know, but, but they do. But they, they need that, you they know. Uh, and, you know, my daughter went through a divorce, and it was, you know, challenging. But, you know, you, you, you are, you, as family, my, I'm, I'm so proud, my wife and I, of course, but of her four siblings, like, you know, you really come together in order to help and help the children and help the, the, the person and, and make that person feel right. that, that it's okay and it's better for you under the circumstances. So, you know, it's, it's, a, crucial, uh, it's a crucial piece to be able to, to say to somebody, um, look, at this point, to your point, you can't get sick of this. You know, yeah. you can't give your life to somebody's, you know, toxic self. Right. That marriage was never asked to give. And again, you know, sometimes it's the choice that you made in the beginning. Sometimes people change, you know, for better and for worse. There's a line that says that if you do not decide to be happy, nobody can make you happy. Mm -hmm. And if you decide to be, if you do, I'm sorry, if you decide to be happy, nobody can make you sad. But if you don't decide to be, if you decide to be sad, nobody can make you happy. So right. it's really, really, really the inner game of recognizing that person's limitations and not losing our, God forbid, our self-esteem because of these relationships. What advice would you give to singles today? To singles today. Do you have any Do you have any clients that are singles? Oh, Did sure, of course, yes. Engagement? Do they have a pregame talk with you? Yes, yes. But I, I think the ones who come to me um, really work on themselves. I, that's usually what I am. I'm 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 not somebody who's uh, just. I mean, I, I'm inspiring to, sure. to whomever I'm seeing, but I really want people to dig deep and see what's going on for themselves. So, you know, people who come to me are usually have had some difficulty, you know, getting their rhythm in, in dating. dating. And it requires them to 
really look at themselves. You know, where do I come from? What is, what is the world, my childhood, my adulthood? What's the message about myself that I received and I don't even realize that I, I see life through that filter. We all have a filter in our sure. brain. And the we're inner seeing child. Ourselves. Right. Exactly. What am I deserving of? Am I deserving of, of love? Am I deserving of, you know, a tough, tough going, keeping me on the hook? Am I deserving of rejection, acceptance, rejection, right. acceptance, rejection? You know what I'm saying? Like, what? What are you doing? So um, it, it, it really comes down to people, be honest. Look at yourself. See? Ask yourself. What kind of marriage do my parents have? Start there, you I, know? I feel like a lot of the singles today, they're, they're, they're a little, uh, I mean, specifically, they want guys that are, you know, 100% set up, the mm -hmm. unrealistic expectations. And I've always heard, you know, I've always known that the money comes from the wife. It comes from the happiness of the wife. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And every, anybody who tells you once they got married and they had shalom, they've, had, they've been more successful and in every area of their lives. Uh, yeah. So it's not like sometimes we, we need to also jump in with the muna. That things, you know, if you have a happy marriage, you'll, you'll be blessed, et cetera. Also financially, a lot of guys are worried to get married because they need to be certain, they need to make a certain amount of money and this certain amount of money. But the blessing really comes from the wife. It really, really mm -hmm. comes a, on the process. So I see a lot of the guys, are, they're scared to jump in because they're worried that they're not going to make enough, et cetera. So there's got to also be a point of a moon also. Yeah. Again, I have the amount of children I have because Hashem told me to. I mean, right. I have five. I don't have... 15. Right. But my point is, I don't know, if I was really, really a secular person, maybe you stop after one or two. I don't sure. know. We get a set, you know, male and female. I don't know. Sure. We, we, do a we make a lot of decisions in our life based on what Hashem wants from us. Um, in a way, I think we're terrific that way. You know, mm -hmm. uh, listen, th as a departure from what you just asked, we'll get back to it. But like, you know, we Jews were guilt ridden. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I go to sleep at night. Did I daven much? Did I learn enough? Right, was right. my daven? You know, I'm always thinking about oh, what I didn't do. So something you know? do, right. And then sometimes I think, oh my gosh, you know, G Hashem must be so happy with all of us. Right. You know, we think about all the hours we're Shabbos and we're learning and we're davening, we're yeah. talking to each other, and we're, yeah, how it's wonderful what we're doing. He must be thrilled. You know, so the point is that you know we we do we follow Hashem blindly. And, you know, with a proper attitude and relationship, you know, we, we trust in him to do what's best for us. And we don't know what's best for us. Right. He knows. And life is, is up and down. So we, we just can't expect it to be smooth. Anybody who expects it to be smooth, and that's a lot of problem with today's generation, problem, yeah. is they expect smooth sailing yeah. and have difficulty understanding that. It ain't smooth sailing, and building up things takes a long time. Marriage, business, children. Once you build up, everybody in this generation, not everybody, you know, people think, well, I'm there. I'll never have another problem again. It, it, untrue. That's right. just not the way. Hashem is working us. He's testing Avram's chesed by saying, kill your firstborn. He's testing Yaakov's honesty by right. telling him to lie. Out of I mean, your comfort zone. You're us. completely yeah, out of your comfort because zone. Because that's what makes us stronger. That's what right. develops us. I don't know why. Uh, ask God. The uh, hundred and svansik, I, I can't wait to hear right. more and understand more. But for now, that's, you know, that's, that's got to be the message that there has to be a muna. Now, to your point, there is a bit of a, a marital issue when, to, you, to what you're saying, if the guy, let's say, is set up and he's already developed and, and then she comes in. You know, there's a problem to that. Unreal. Some, some the of these problem to that is, is when you're not building together, then mm -hmm. he feels more ownership over what he's done. You know, like, you weren't here. I, I did this on my own. Now you want this, that, this, that, whatever. Uh, no, I mean, there's a sense of ownership as opposed to when, you, when you're together. married together and you build together, whether one is in the other business or not. We did this together. You know, I, I, I helped you, whether actually in the management office or just by giving you love. And, and we we feel like we built this together. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, so we're important. supposed to develop in a way and not be so worried. Now, it goes back and forth. Men sometimes feel they have to be very established because women sometimes are looking for somebody who's already made it. And they, it, it's an absolute, you know, or whatever. So it, it bounces off each other in the wrong way. Right. But what, you re what we should realize in two your point, and I, I, I imagine research bears this out, is that when people are in, lo are in love, they do everything better, okay? 100%. We know they heal better. We know they get out of the hospital better. Um, I, I'm sure they, they 
do business, they, they make great businesses that way. I mean, when we have love at home and we come home and we're built and we're out in the world and we right. feel that somebody's always with us and we have a, a, a beautiful family, even though my kids are vomiting in the night and this one's got trouble in school, yeah, yeah, and yeah. But when we feel like in the end we have so that important. one person, we shine and fly in a way that, that is beyond. And, and definitely, you know, today's, you know, I mean, I spend a lot of time on prayer because I know I, if I want to change a specific character trait of mine, it's I can Google it up, I can read it. Mm -hmm. It's not happening until I bring it down into my heart. Yeah. And I said to myself, you know, the, the most old-fashioned thing is, is prayer. Some of us are walking around with these, and we don't, we don't pray to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you can read a lot of things, but it's still in your head. You still have to bring it down into your heart. Yeah. And this is another thing that I, 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 I said, listen, sometimes you have this issue, you got to pray for it. Yes. You know, if I yes. want to stop resenting my wife, I, it's not just going to happen in a logical way. Mm -hmm. I have to please God help me not see the negativity in people, not let n n never see anything ugly in them. It, it's a prayer that I have to literally spend mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And that's actually giving to the marriage also yeah. when you're actually, you know, praying for yourself to be able to see the good in them. Yeah, very much so. You know, to you, it's prayer. To, uh, to me, I, I, I learn. To somebody right. else, it's chesed. But here's the message that I think you're giving, which is beyond wonderful. We have to have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch. Right. And many people pray, learn, do chesed, they have no they have very little relationship. Your point is, I'm praying to God, I'm saying, God, I, I, I want to give. Through. I'm to, you're my therapist, I'm working this right. through with you. That's what Hashem wants from us. He has standards that to make sure we're connected. But he wants us in the daytime to say, oh, Hashem, please help me through this. You know, I made this mistake, help me through that. Yeah. I want to be better in this way. That's the thing, when you learn, when you do chesed, whatever you're doing, you want to walk around feeling like Hashem is present in my life. And instead of like we all do, and, you know, instead yeah, think, oh my so God, uh, here's water. Do you know how many people in this world don't have water? I mean, it's sad, you know? I, I got water, right. you know, to say to Hashem, thank you. I have, God for me is, is, is he's taking care of me, you know? That's, that's really cool. Back to appreciation. You know? At the end of the day, it's that's back really to appreciation. Cool. It's at the yes. end of the day, it's back I, to appreciation. I, I, I say when, when you go to davening, we know that the, the chazan or the cantor, uh, Baal Tvila, he, he says chazar sashats. He repeats the Shimon Esri, the Amidah. Correct. That was done for a time when people didn't know how to how to, right. how to daven. So he nowadays we all do it, and he doesn't he doesn't necessarily have us in mind. It doesn't really work to uh, for us to fulfill obligation. So he's doing it just because that was the standard. We just say amen to everybody, whatever. There's one place mm. in Chazar Sashats that you have to stand up and say on your own, Beautiful. Modim Anachulach. We thank you, God. Right. That's the one thing that you cannot, you know, telegraph into God is I thank you. And that's why the rabbis have a stand up and, and, and have a say that. Amazing. Tell me a little bit about your um any tell me about a little bit about your books and your programs that you created sure, after, I will. after thirty five years. Yeah. Before before I just want to mention one thing sure. to singles, okay? On their list, top of the list, kind and giving. Yeah. You because 35 years now, right? And I'm not at, I'm going to be at 50, God willing, 60, amen, 70 amen. mark. God willing. But 35 years is 35 years. 35 years is 35 years. You it's know a what I'm long saying? time. It's a lot of experience. And, and, every, and everybody thinks, oh, you, you know, people, uh, everybody, you know, oh, you had it easy. She's so wonderful, brilliant, beautiful. You're there. Come on, Come guys. On. Come right. on. Life is hard. You know, it's because the two of us have always been drawn to each other. And both of us are just very giving people, you know, we'll, we'll sacrifice and we're happy to sacrifice for the other person. We would be so tired in bed. I remember when the kids were younger and we had five kids. The, when we had five kids, the oldest was six. OK, right. so so that means we had, you know, a lot of kids, you know, crunched together. So we'd be so tired and we didn't say tonight's your night, tonight's your night. Tonight. We knew that whoever had the slightest bit of energy would wow. get up. Because I wouldn't want my wife to get up if I had a bit of energy. And she wouldn't want me to get up if she had a little bit of energy left. That's incredible. And when you think about marriage, you want as much a person who's giving and, and, and kind. Because you need that more than anything. anything. Yes, love, sense of humor, good looking. I, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. But at the heart of it, 
all of if I had to choose one thing, that's the one thing you want to choose. Wow. If you're dating and the person is not showing that sense of kindness and givingness, you know, they're playing, they're, it's difficult, it's hard, it's challenging, they're this, they're nice today, they're not nice tomorrow, they're, you say something and they're calling you out, oh my right. gosh. You treat each other Run the like way you hell, treat go, the way go you away, yourself, you know, right. stop it. Stop it. That's not that's not what you need in a, in, in a marriage that's going to be long term. Chesed. Chesed. The world yeah. is built on chesed. Absolutely. Beautiful. That's what Avram, and he was the first of all of us. And there's a reason why the first had to be chesed. You know, before MS and before the other things, it starts with chesed because he understood God made the world through chesed. Correct. We are here because of chesed. And that's the thing we can give. And there is a Gemara that says that if somebody is not a Baal chesed, you know, you can question, you can wonder if they're Jewish. Wow. You know? Now, I'm not saying we should use that as right. an actual but it's practical in the, it's in technique. No, it's in but it's in DNA. the DNA. Exactly. It's in the DNA. Um, as far as myself, well, one of the things that um, I, I, I do love is when people, you know, get back to me. I have a, a marriage program that's online. Uh, if you go to newmanmethod.com, that's N-E-U. M-A-M, newmanmethod.com, and I have a, an 11-episode marriage program. And it's, it's, for, it's for people. I mean, I, I, I don't have time personally sure. for everyone. I, I have a full practice. I do my best to include people. Um, but it, it really um, helps people. It helps people even if they've cheated. There's a special section there if it's post-infidelity. Um, but uh, otherwise than that, it's talking about, you know, all the secrets that I've learned over the time. This is a, a, little, uh, a little taste little taste of, of what it is and, and how to really end fighting, how to communicate better. So that's very important mm -hmm. to me that I was able to do that. My daughter, Esther Newman, who is also a very a brilliant psychotherapist in, on her own, and we've done that together. Um, we also started a podcast called Shrinks on the Street. Oh, I and, love it. And uh, we've done some and uh, we'll be uh, restarting. Uh, we, we did through COVID. COVID got a little bit in the way, as we did with everything. So, but uh, rebooting uh, soon. So that will be shrinks uh, on the street. Shrinks on the street, and that will, and that's a lot of uh, psychological talk, and more so, uh, it has a lot of question answer, so that Beautiful. people can really get their questions in live, and we can really talk to people and create a community like that. So we're and very your excited books? about that. Which books? You oh, there's books. There's books. There's lots wow. of books. Good for you, you know. So um, there's. Uh, Emotional infidelity. Uh, there's um, helping your kids cope with divorce. Sandcastles away. The truth about cheating. Mm -hmm. uh, connect to love. Uh, the long way home, which is interesting. Uh, it's one for children who were divorced who are now adults to mm -hmm. help them understand and unpack their past specifically as it relates to divorce. Uh, you know, just lots of good things. I, 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 you know, Baruch Hashem that God took this. You know, little nobody from Baltimore, Maryland, and wow. let me reach people amen, and amen. connect to Oprah and, and and all these other spaces and and you and and everybody who who just wants to help people. It's, it's, so a, it's a wonderful yeah. space to be in. The reason why we, we want to have these podcasts because at the end of the day, this is all considered dot and dot mm -hmm. equals mercy. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Gemara says black and white when when there's no dot, there's no mercy. So the extent that we get mercy in our lives is basically to the extent that we work on ourselves yeah. and we acquire the right consciousness. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gary, for, ha for being Thank here, you. especially on a Sunday. <laughs> um, and it was it was so hard to get you, but we're so, so really this is going to definitely change a lot of people's lives. I hope so. And hopefully Thank they'll you. contact you. Thank you again, Gary. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. It was great. Good. It was great.